Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. <laughs> what was that? It's, it's my Enthusiasm, intro. Enthusiasm, yeah, just off the charts. Don't you like that? I'm pumped. Part three Q&A series. Are you not pumped, Tim? Have you been doing drugs? Well, you know, we had that little break there. and I was low on energy. <laughs> What's that? I, no. I, had, I had a Red Bull. <laughs> uh, yeah, part three Q&A. A lot of great questions so far. So keen to get into this one and see what other great questions we have. But before we do... Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their CryoSheet Graphene Thermal Pads, which are an excellent alternative to thermal pastes. They offer very high thermal conductivity with no liquid components, so they can't dry out and therefore don't degrade over time like pastes and even liquid metals. CryoSheet is very easy to use. It's extremely durable and is available in a range of sizes to suit most applications. I've personally done some high-end GPU testing with CryoSheet and the results were impressive, very similar in fact to that of liquid metal, but without the mess and of course, no risk of drying out. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. All right, Tim, more Computex related questions here I see. Go for it. And it's leaked stuff as well, so you'll love that. Leaked information indicates that Gigabyte will be announcing their upcoming Intel Z890. I always hate that, it's gonna take so long to. Okay, yep. Yep, so, yep, 890 motherboards at Computex next week, which will support next gen Arrow Lake processors. Are you excited to check out these boards? Uh, what do you think LJ1851 or the LJ1851 platform needs to deliver in order to be relevant because let's be real it was difficult to recommend lj 1700 once am5 uh got going which i, I guess mm -hmm. is fair enough uh right so yeah i think these boards will probably pop up as yeah, whether they'll actually have the chipsets on them or whatever, I'm not sure. It could be like Intel Next Gen board. Yeah, something so like that. Intel may announce or hint at the Next Gen CPUs coming later this year. Um, we don't have any insider information on that, but I, yeah, that's exciting stuff. If we get to see some new board designs and what stuff we'll mm -hmm. possibly be able to test later in the year, that's good. Um, so I'm definitely excited to check those boards out, and if they're there, we will get some uh, footage and stuff and give you guys whatever information we can get. What do we think the platform needs to deliver in order to be relevant? Uh, I mean, it's sort of, I guess the CPUs are a big part of the platform, obviously. So competitive performance, like what we've been seeing from Intel, but uh, competitive in terms of power efficiency as well, that would go a long way in um, improving things there. The leaked information suggests that the Arrow Lake CPUs will be limited to 8P cores, which again makes sense because we know that gaming doesn't really require, uh, I don't want to more than 8 cores, but it's cores of a certain performance. If you have 8 yep. very powerful cores, then you, you don't need more for gaming. Like games do not yep. require that much CPU processing power. And then you've got the yep. E cores to take care of background tasks. And depending on how well they've dialed in the scheduling by then, that can be of benefit. And they're pretty good for multi-core productivity as well. Certain workloads yeah. they're very good for, um, and yep. other workloads they're not super efficient. So that is a bit of a drawback of that hybrid design, but it's better than not having them, I guess, in um, a lot of those situations. So competitive performance, competitive power efficiency, that'd be good. That'd be a big start. Mm -hmm. And I think things that we obviously, stuff we always harp on about, um, I'm less concerned about features like PCI Express standards and stuff like that, because we've seen they're that they're always, not... they're always, they're so far ahead now, like yep. piece, both PCI and what's the other, like memory as well, to some degree. It's probably fast enough. Like yep. I imagine the platform is going to be DDR5, so that's probably going to limit that. But like PCI 5.0, does it need to be five or six or seven? It's like makes no difference for most people at the moment. Yep, yep. Five is more than um, yeah. more than capable at this point in time and massively mm -hmm. underutilized. So that we don't, I don't care about those features so much. Obviously, more lanes and things like that are always desirable because it just means you can do more with the boards mm -hmm. rather than just the standard almost very little. Um, and yeah, I guess the thing we harp on about the most is platform longevity. Will Intel commit to this platform beyond? you know, a generation and then a refined generation and then let's go mm -hmm. to a new socket? Uh, probably I mean, not. Intel should be opening up their announcement of this by saying our next platform will be supported for four or five years. That, that they have to, that, that's the, that makes or breaks the platform at the moment. Platform longevity is so important to buyers and the reason why 
a significant reason, in my opinion, why you know, AMD is kind of mopping the floor in the DIY market is because of that feature. So it needs to be the cornerstone of their announcement. It's, uh, it's not something to push to the end to put on a little slide, a little footnote being like, hey guys, maybe these platforms will last a long time. It needs to be, these are our new CPUs. They're faster, more efficient, or whatever combination they can achieve of that. And our new platform will support X number of generations into the future. Put it on the box, huge letters. I think it's the most powerful marketing point yeah. they would have um, for yeah. sure. Because then there'll be their platform, especially for people who are thinking of platform upgrading, will be at least well, about two years effectively newer than AMD's platform. So that'll be a, that would be a really interesting discussion for CPU buyers of, you know, do you go with the AM5 platform, which you've already two years into now, and it maybe will support one or two more generations, although by the time Arrowlet comes out, Zen 5 will be out, so that'll change things as well. Or do you go with the new Intel platform, which if they're promising two years of, or two generations or three generations of support, that could last for more into the future than AM5, if they do yeah, end up can, promising it's, that. It's like a situation where you can say, well, it won't be relevant then, because maybe AMD only supports one more generation, so the fact that you're only getting one more Intel generation it's irrelevant for people buying at that point in time, which is somewhat true, but it's given AMD a head start mm -hmm. and allowed well, them to capture so many more people than yeah, they would have you otherwise. Just, you just buy an AMD platform again because, you know, if, you, if you're like on AM4 at the moment mm -hmm. and you're thinking, oh, do I go AM5 or do I go Intel? Both of them are offering similar future support in terms of number of generations beyond the current gen. I feel like a lot of people would stick with what they know, especially if performance and other things are competitive. They're not going to make the jump to Intel. Like what got people to jump from Intel to AMD was all of those features, the performance, the value. It was compelling from so many different angles that got people to really change their mindset. Whereas if the two things were very similar, I think you would have seen Intel just continue to dominate in terms of people just upgrading from Intel to Intel. And I think AMD is in a position now where people will be upgrading from AMD to AMD largely on brand in some ways. Mm -hmm. So they, they really have to go, you know, well, it's also move somewhere else. Also, you know? as we've been saying, like it then just becomes a moot point. It's like, ah, platform longevity at this point in time, we think both platforms have at least one more generation in them. What that'll bring, we don't know. So it's not really, it goes mm -hmm. back to them performance features, yeah. efficiency, all that sort of stuff. Whereas with Intel, it, that the platform argument that we make actually then swings in their favor yeah that's right so now we've got you know if you if you're buying a, if you're building a new system forget what you currently have so if you're already on am5 then you're probably looking at an am5 processor but if you're on an older platform or you don't have anything at all and you're looking at building a new pc uh we recommend you know this may be the case where we'd recommend getting intel because they're going to support another two generations where amd is only supporting one so if you're spending good money on your motherboard, you get to keep it. That's that's a few, mm -hmm. huge benefit. It's a huge benefit at both ends of the market as well. Like we talk about things like upscaling being more beneficial the higher the resolution. We talk about ray tracing being more beneficial at the high end because you actually have the performance to leverage it to a degree that makes sense. But when it comes to platform longevity, it's super beneficial at both ends of the market. So if you buy a really expensive high-end motherboard, like let's say with AM5, for example, and it has you know, M.2 PCIe 5.0. It's got all this stuff. That that board is going to be $200 plus and you're happy to spend that money because you know it can support future generations of CPU. So that's good, right? And then at the more entry level, the boards are still quite pricey because DDR5 and PCIe 5.0 boards just are pricey, whether it's AMD or Intel. Knowing that spending $120 on that board, it's got a decent VRM if you've watched our B650 guide, you'll be able to use that board into the future. It just makes, it adds value at both ends of the market and also ease of upgrade and all those other things that are great mm -hmm. to have where you don't have to, you know, change, gut your whole system, potentially reinstall Windows, do all that sort of stuff. So it's just, it's a hugely beneficial feature to have. And I think it's something Intel really needs to jump on um, because if they don't, it's just, it's a big missed opportunity really. And it makes their platform nowhere near as desirable as AMD's. Yep, agreed. So hopefully they do that. They've certainly had a lot of time to think about and learn from those you know, what's been key for people in the market at the moment. But, you know, there's potentially, they're looking at things like OEMs where, you know, a lot of Intel sales at the moment are still OEM type systems where you really don't want platform longevity. So it's kind of like, 
you know, Adele is, doesn't want people to just upgrade the CPU in their system. They want you to buy an entire new system every time. So there's kind of yeah, I don't know how conflicting people, sort of it is a bit, priorities there. How many, like, how many of those customers actually do that? And the, the whole reason we got 14th gen refresh was for those customers where they can mm. say, oh, get the new 14th gen. Into, say, yeah. Uh, I don't know how relevant that is there either, I think. Yeah, I guess it depends whether Intel sees the customer as being Dell, the system maker, or the end user. Because if, you, if you're making the CPU for the end user, to pe- either for people to buy directly the box mm. CPUs or buy it through a Dell, then you would want platform longevity so people buy the CPUs. Because it doesn't really matter whether Dell or you build your own system. You know, Either way, you get a system... Either customer you can sell your CPUs to because of platform longevity. But if they see Dell as their customer, not the end user, then Dell is probably going to be telling them, or HP or whoever brand, right? They're going to be telling them, hey, guys, do not give us platform longevity. Please lock your systems down so that we can sell an entire new system the next time. We can, you know... Basically, tell customers this this box that you're buying has no upgrade ability, mm-hmm. so you're going to have to buy another Dell in another couple of years to get the performance again. So mm. it really depends there. I'm not sure where Intel sees their customers at the moment and who their customers are, and I think what they do with this next generation will tell us a lot about that. Mm-hmm. About you know, AMD clearly, I think, makes the CPU buyer the customer, not Dell or ASUS or you know whoever, but not sure about Intel. They still get a lot of sales for their laptops, obviously huge for them as well. So we'll see. But I think it'll be a huge mistake if they don't make it a, not just a footnote, a big marketing push about that. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. All right, Steve, this is a question related to other questions regarding the Intel CPU's instability fiasco. Mm. How will this affect reviews moving forward and how will you tackle reviews of CPUs that were already done in favorable motherboard settings that can create stability issues to some buyers at default settings? Uh, the answer is I don't know yet, just like Intel probably doesn't. They're still trying to work <laughs> this whole thing out. As for reviews that have been done, um, I'm pretty comfortable with those reviews anyway because for the most part, we weren't really recommending those CPUs because yeah, AM5 platform better, platform support, all that sort of stuff. And obviously Zen 4 has become much more competitively priced um, since launch. So... It wasn't like we were really pushing LJ1700 really hard in those day one reviews. Uh, I think the 12th gen was very competitive upon launch, and we were promoting that quite heavily and and saying that was a good buy. But I think from 13th gen on, Mm -hmm. AMD's been very competitive, and it's probably been our preferred choice for most situations. So, yeah, that stuff doesn't change too much. As for future reviews, yeah, complicated. I I can't answer the question yet because I, I... there's no answers. So we know for k parts, there is now a performance profile and an extreme profile. An extreme profile is what Intel has been testing them at, um, slightly different to the sort of no power limits that most of the boards have been running with, but not a huge difference there overall. Even power consumption's fairly similar. I don't think we're going to... See, well, at, again, at the moment, the MSI boards with Core i9 processors using the current BIOS that was you know, released to address all of this, they do default to the performance profile, which is PL1 at only 125 watts with the, uh, so that's the long power limit, the long duration power limit. And then the, the sort of 56 second turbo window power limit is 253 watts. So that's quite a substantial difference, especially for all core workloads going down to 125 watts instead of just staying at 253 watts like the extreme profile does. But I'm hearing from, from MSI now that maybe they'll be changing that and they'll be defaulting to the extreme profile, not the performance profile. And then there's no baseline profile for K-SKU parts. That's for non-K parts. It's a mess. It's a mess. The motherboard manufacturers don't really seem to know what to do. And then on top of all of this, Intel's still saying that brands such as MSI are still allowed to run without power limits. That's up to their discretion. Um, so if they've got a really beefy VRM and the user, you know, is encouraged to use an impressive cooler, then they still can run Core i9 parts without power limits and that's within spec. So it's all wishy-washy. It's really done sort of a get out of jail free card for Intel. So if you have a high-end motherboard with a 1400K 
and your board is either running you've you've selected the no power limits i think even msi they'll i think what they're going to do is they're going to default to extreme but the no power limits option will be there but you can select that from a drop down list so i want to run without power limits and if you do that which is still in spec but if it's unstable rather than replace your cpu with a better quality cpu intel will just say well you know that's you're not running at the default spec so <laughs> It's sort of dodgy language, and the default spec could be the extreme profile, and if that doesn't work, it could be the performance profile. Just keep getting lower and so lower and in, lower until in, they until, have... Yeah, because yeah. there's... And even the language I got from MSI was really confusing, because MSI said the language from Intel was the performance profile is the default profile and the extreme profile is the recommended profile. Now, what is the difference between default and recommended? Do you know? I read that email and I was beyond confused. So it's it's dodgy. If you have performance problems, rather than have to deal with it, they're just like, well, you're doing the wrong thing. You know, have you used the recommended settings or the default settings? Try either of those. And if and if using the default, which is 125 watt for long duration, if that works, then your system works as expected. It's it's behaving within spec. Not a good situation. To answer your question, how do reviewers go about this? Again, I, I don't know because we've got to see if, for example, the bulk of the Z790 motherboards, um, and I suppose Z690 motherboards with these updated biases once they become publicly released biases and it's all sort of set in stone, if they default to 125 watts with 14900 Ks for the long duration, I think that's how we would um, opt to test. Uh or we would test the performance profile and the extreme profile, which doing that for all the K-skew parts is a bit of a nightmare and would lead to just chaotic graphs and it's hard to work out what's what. So I, I, I guess we just have to wait and see, which yep. is what we've been doing now for a while uh, as to where this mess lands, what what settings yep. uh, uh, make the most sense to be the, not, not the recommended, the <laughs> default settings. <laughs> all right, Tim. When building a new setup, a lot of the guides just look at the PC itself and assign a budget to it. And we did that very recently. Assuming that you already have some basic peripherals that you can use. Yeah, okay. But if you were to do a full setup guide from scratch, how much budget and importance would you assign to the peripherals when compared to the PC specs? I mm -hmm. say a $2,000 budget for someone who enjoys AAA gaming like, you know, um, Baldur's Gate 3 or Alan Wake 2. What kind of headphones, keyboard, mouse, controller, screens, etc. would you personally recommend? Yeah, I would never do that kind of content, that kind of guide, because it's so personalized. So the computer itself, there's generally combinations that you can steer someone in the direction of that, that makes sense. And, and build guides are guides. It's our, it's our default recommended guide so we, have we some, class default and recommended as the same yeah we have some wriggle room is what i'm getting at so if my recent video people were like why didn't you go with the 78 yeah uh, the the 700 xt and it's like well look you can do that if you change the budget around or do whatever this is like a recommender we think this is a pretty solid foundation uh, if you want to place a bit more importance on some of the other components then go ahead and do that i mean we've got endless benchmark videos for cpus and gpus that will let you know on what to do there when it comes to monitors, I mean, we have a thing called Monitors Unboxed. Um, what size monitor do you want? Do you, do you want a, you know, a 27? Do you want a 32? Do you want bigger than that? So yeah. it comes down to the monitor technology that you want, depending on the use case and what you're after. Um, I mean, Tim can probably speak to that. As for keyboards and mice, I mean, yes, there are some keyboards and mice that are better than others for gaming it's kind of subjective some of it can be technically proven but then it comes down to like the if, if a mouse is like this is the mouse this is yeah. the mouse that conquers all mice and you're like yeah but i'm left-handed and it's right-handed or it's not you know ambidextrous or yeah like i just don't like those ultralight mice that a lot of competitive gamers like yeah like, it, i just don't it, like it might them at be, all might be too light for you like you don't want the light mouse or it might be too small or it's got a grip that you don't like so it's so subjective. And the same thing with keyboards. I mean, yeah, it's got tactile switches, but you know, you might not like the layout or it might not have some of the buttons or things that you like to use. So you've really got to research what keyboards, you know, fit. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of why we haven't gone into peripherals because it is, 
you can really do your scientific testing and stuff like that. And you're sure some products will be bad products. Shouldn't buy those, but then you could really dial it down to 30 keyboards that are all good and will service your needs. So then like, do you like the one with the blue lights? <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's a bit the same with computer cases as well. So why we don't like to do those I mean, again, there are some bad computer cases that, you know, won't pass the game as Nexus airflow test. And that's good information to have. So you should go research, a ca- basically find a case you like, you know, like, Oh, that one ticks all the boxes. It has the motherboard, dimensions that i want it has the expansion options that i want i will now go to gamers nexus and see if it actually moves air or if it's a glass oven so yeah re- find what what it is you want and research that way and uh, we try to do that sort of stuff because you need a case so we will do a bit of research into what's a good value case but yeah keyboards mice i mean do you want a little gamepad thing are you doing games that you use that or not like it just I guess you could throw that as an optional. We recommend this one, but again, it's so subjective. How many little gamepad things would there be that um, are better for certain games or whatever, or styles? So I feel like as well, the PC, the reason why a lot of the guides focus on the PC is because it is largely the most important component. Like your gaming experience is going to be, at least I feel like, mostly dictated by the PC and the monitor that you get. The keyboard, yeah, I mean... You can buy all sorts of different keyboards that have slightly changed one thing or another, but your overall gaming experience, whether you get you know, key cap, you know, key switch type A or key switch type B, is probably going to be much more similar than if you, you know, changed a component in your computer or bought a different monitor. So I feel like, you know, if you're allocating a budget, like a total budget for how much to spend on the PC, how much to spend on the peripherals, I think that most people would say spend most of the money on the PC. And I feel like monitors are a bit, un- people spend maybe not enough on their monitor at times. And this is a video that I do want to make for the Hardware Unbox channel, sort of exploring, you know, should you make your PC better via, let's say, CPU or GPU upgrade or buy a much better monitor? I feel like a lot of the time, you know, if you're spending $1,500 on a PC, but you're only spending two or $300 on the monitor, you're probably almost like capping your gaming experience because the monitor you've bought is kind of not good enough Mm -hmm. for the amount that you've put into your PC. So I feel like monitor is very important. That's why we have our dedicated monitors channel. But you brought up some great points about how like how subjective keyboards are. Like if you spend $100 on a keyboard or you spend $300 on a keyboard, is that going to be as different as spending $100 on a monitor versus $300 on a monitor? I feel like a monitor is going to be very different at those price tiers, whereas a keyboard, you're probably in like, diminishing returns quite quickly after a certain budget like i know people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on custom keyboards and there's that whole community around that, and that's great people love doing that as sort of a hobby mm-hmm. but for me personally is that going to provide the the value there mm-hmm. so yeah i feel like if you're spending two thousand dollars on your pc all up again like a 12 or 1300 dollar system maybe 400 to 500 on your monitor and the rest on the peripherals is probably probably where i'd be sitting and peripherals are pretty easy to upgrade as well things like don't like that keyboard easiest swap out ever basically yeah and and that sort of goes to the first part of the question like the assumption isn't that oh i need a new computer so Mm -hmm. are you building a whole new setup where you do require all these parts or you're just upgrading as you do one and maybe Mm -hmm. the monitor does need an upgrade but you're like i'll do my computer now in six mm-hmm. months, I'll do the monitor because I want to get a really good monitor upgrade, and then you know I'll upgrade my keyboard and mouse as they break or whatever. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, and look, you could recommend good quality components that are good value in those builds, but that almost becomes content in on itself. So your keyboard buying guide: how many price ranges have you got, and then how many keyboards fit within those price ranges that are worth looking at, depending on your preferences, and you end up with. I did one for TechSpot once. I think we had like 50 keyboards or something we looked at. They just had a stack of them and you know, a lot of them were good, but it came yeah. down to your individual preferences. Like, did you want a wrist rest? Did you want this? Did you yeah. want that? Did you want USB pass through? So on and so forth. Yeah. And I feel like people who are going like they're, they, they are doing what you're saying in this question of buying everything at once. Like that's going to be someone who wasn't a PC gamer and mm-hmm. is now mm-hmm. just for the first time jumping into PC gaming I feel like most people who jump into PC gaming are probably not going all out and spending tons and tons of money on something because, you know, you you might not like it. Like, yeah. you've never done it before. It's like you kind of – I remember back when I was 
building PCs, and most people that I know that built PCs for the first time, you're pretty young. Like I did it when I was a teenager. I didn't exactly have an unlimited huge budget to spend on everything, mm -hmm. in which cases then, yeah, you're probably going to be trying to put as much into the PC and sort of min-maxing a little bit. As people who are on a budget tend to do, you buy the crappy peripherals in the, in the hopes of upgrading them later. Whereas I think, it, yeah, someone who's spending two, $3,000 on everything at once, I, I don't think there's that many people that do that. I'm sure there are people that do, but yeah, to buy everything at once on that sort of budget, I can't see it being sort of a common thing, which again, I think goes to why you'd split that content into different sort mm -hmm. of things, buying buying guides for each thing, mm -hmm. as opposed to here's our $5,000 all in PC stuff, like what's everything you need? I don't know how relevant that would be for most people. Mm -hmm. The Radeon RX 7600 XT, so the 16 gigabyte version of the 7600, I suppose, and the GeForce RTX 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte are about the same price, at least where I live. Mm -hmm. Would you take the 16 gigabyte VRM or the better performance and features of the 4060 Ti? Uh, that question really does depend on what i'm playing so if i'm playing fortnite uh so esports titles or more competitive shooter style games basically games that you don't really care about visuals too much it's more about the gaming experience then i would go the geforce gpu um, mm -hmm. they're also generally huh, generally they are a bit better for that sort of stuff the esports titles so i would go with the 8 gigabyte 4060 ti I mean, normally in the US, the 4062 8GB is quite a bit more expensive. Mm, so this is. is, I'm assuming this is a case where the 7600 XT 16GB is too expensive. Yeah. I can't imagine the NVIDIA GPU is astonishingly cheap. So I think it's probably more likely that the 7600 XT is more clo closer to, I think they're like $390 US for the NVIDIA GPU. Yeah. So I imagine it's, it's a tough up from match 330 up, up to that like point. Yeah. The 16 gigabytes of VRAM is obviously good and it will be of more benefit going forward. But 4062 or 8 gigabyte, while I absolutely... Like, I don't like either of these products, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't like either of them. And I sort of loathe the 4062 or 8 gigabyte. It should have always just been the 16 gigabyte model and that was it. Yeah. Um, if, if I had the choice, I guess... Yeah, if you had the choice of either of those products and they were the same money, whatever that money is, mm -hmm. and you had to pick which one, what are you picking... I would feel like I was getting rolled either way and I've sort good. of been forced into the wrong – yeah. It's hard because, like, I'd i first have to almost look at, like, the benchmark well, charts and things. Hang on. Sorry. No, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. I'm going to restructure this. Right. They are both available for $300 US. Right. <sighs> at $300 US. I mean, 8 gigabytes isn't as bad at $300 US and it is faster – and but, but you're a trip. So if you're a competitive gamer, you're going the GeForce GPU in that comparison. Yeah, so the 16 yeah, gigabytes yeah. of VRAM and the slower raster performance isn't what you want. Yeah. But you're a AAA gamer. Three hundred dollars is your price point. I don't know the exact percentage at to which the 4060 Ti is faster, but it is quite a bit. Yeah, it's faster. quite a bit faster. Yeah, it's a hard one. I, I guess. I guess the the. Th the way I would approach that is how many games am I going to be playing and likely playing into the future that I'm limited by the VRAM capacity? Mm. Like w how bad is the game that I'm playing going to look on the 4060 Ti with only 8 gigabytes of memory, assuming there's missing textures and, and whatnot, or how stuttery is the performance going to be so I have to lower the textures to, to a lower level? And, you know, there's obviously a few examples where the 4060 Ti kind of falls apart because it's 8 gigabytes of memory, but then there's examples where... You can dial it where... down to fix it, though. See, the VRAM yeah. thing, you've got to be really careful with this. The, the VRAM thing matters a lot, depending on the performance tier and the price. Yeah. But you can generally solve the VRAM problem. So ha not having enough VRAM on a more expensive, higher tier product where you maybe want to, you've bought a GeForce GPU because you want to try out ray tracing, which uses even more VRAM mm -hmm. and, and cr cripples performance even further. That's a big problem. But when we're talking about the budget products, mm -hmm. VRAM is a lot less of a concern. Obviously $300 for eight gigabytes still sucks. Let's, yeah, yeah it still sucks. Yeah. But if you're getting, 
if you're getting much more rasterization performance, then you're almost happy to work around the VRAM limits by dialing down textures and making yeah, sure it's that like, you're not. It's like how much can you? It's kind of like the the 460 uh, Ti is going to have like higher other settings but lower texture settings, and then the it's going to be the opposite for the 7600 XT where you might not be able to run at say like a high settings, you might have to dial it down to medium, but you'll be able to crank the textures up to maximum. So it's kind of like, which of those things are you preferring at the same price? And you kind of also have to then think, well, what's going to happen in the future? Like, where's that balance of things going to... <laughs> Even if I play AAA titles, I am prior prioritizing performance. I want to get more yeah. towards high refresh rate than I do high quality textures. Mm -hmm. um, within reason, like the textures within, can't, yeah. they can't be mud, but you can die with eight gigabyte cards. You can dial them down to the point where they're not mud. So, you so I would go the 4060 Ti for the extra mm -hmm. rasterization, extra rasterization performance at, if they were the same price at say, at a hundred, lower price, at a lower price. If they're both $400, it's like, Oh geez. Like that's, that's, yeah. that's a, yeah, that's, well, that's rough. I think I agree, I, I agree I mean, with you. The VRAM, the benefit of VRAM can only go so far in the face of a product that is significantly faster. Mm -hmm. So, again, like 4060, you know, the 4060 versus the 3060, for example, 12 gigabytes versus 8 gigabytes. If the if the 3060 back in the day was way faster, or the 46, I mean, the 7600 came out and was way faster, then... Again, that would change the discussion about 8 versus 12 gigabytes of VRAM as it has with AMD cards for a while, how much faster they need to be and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yep. It's a difficult one, but hopefully in the future we won't be running into these sort of discussions. Yeah, well, in the past we've had these discussions. It's generally been the Radeon GPU that offers better rasterization performance at a lower price point with more VRAM. Mm -hmm. That's yep. a bit more of a no-brainer. But when the Radeon GPU is significantly slower... Mm. at the same price point it's like uh i'm not sure i'm prioritizing vram as much there yeah that's right yep uh, okay is nvidia using narrow vram bus widths on its or memory bus widths on its new geforce cards to limit their capability in machine learning slash ai training to push people towards their data center products uh, does the narrow VRAM bus width make including more VRAM more difficult or expensive? And then finally, does lower memory bandwidth hurt performance in games? Okay, so I'll work through these one by one. For the first one, uh, they use the same silicon, whether it's the GeForce or the AI training stuff, at least to my knowledge. So for the card format, because the server parts are different. Sure. It's an entirely different architecture. But yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But that, that's like... Are you really going to be putting a GeForce GPU into a server? Yeah, right. Probably not so, the same yeah, market, really. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about like the traditional. You're talking well, like a work. The quattros that are now like the RTX A6000, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. like what? Uh, like for workstation type training AI features. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Well, Those use the same. They would yeah. be the ones we would have to be comparing, all right? Because. I would have thought so. Because you're not buying the actual real data center GPUs for gaming. Well, that's what, that's what was kind of my point, right? Like, okay. you, you're not going, oh, do I want to buy a, I don't know what they're called now, the Hopper GPUs, the Blackwell GPUs. Yeah, they're crazy which, accelerators. Which, they're accelerator cards. You're not going, hm, do I want for RTX 4090 or do I want to buy an entire Blackwell server? Uh, yeah, probably yeah, not so too much. Yeah, so if we're talking about there. what were traditionally, you know, Quattro workstation yeah. type GPUs, that was just different drivers and software support, stuff like that. Uh, so they had the same... Silicon, the same yeah. memory bus widths and stuff like that. I think they that. often offer double the VRAM, but apart from that, similar. Yes. Essentially, why we're seeing narrower memory bus widths on these more consumer-oriented products is because it's cheaper to produce. You know, yeah. They, they get higher yields because the, the chips end up being smaller and they can make up for it in other ways or yeah, whatever. So it's, it's basically a cost-cutting thing, I suppose, you would, you would put it down to. Uh, does the narrow VRAM bus width make including more VRAM uh, more difficult or expensive? Uh, I don't think it really does either of those things um, because again, it's a, it's a, as in terms of expense, it's a cheaper approach. And we've seen with like a 4060 Ti, they can just uh, employ the clamshell method, and that's a pretty mm -hmm. quick and relatively easy way of of doubling the memory. I mean, Nvidia told us it was really difficult and really expensive, and that's why it was a hundred dollars more, but. You know, recent history has proven that to be not the case. And we've seen that, yep. you know, 
AMD has been able to do it on a relatively low end part, such as the mm-hmm. RX. Uh, and if you're increasing 7, XT. if you're increasing the bus width to increase the VRAM, that has implications for the board in terms mm-hmm. of its board layout and expensive traces and those sort of things. Mm-hmm. More more memory bus equals more traces, more layout complications, more bandwidth, so, which is yeah. I guess the third question. Yeah. So it does lower memory bandwidth, obviously, because you you've got less lanes going to the memory chips. So you know yep. less bandwidth does that hurt performance in games? Yeah, sure it can. Uh, sort of dependent on stuff like core count and other things as well and how memory starved a particular configuration is but yeah it's just a more a cost of a more cost effective approach which is why they've yep. done that yep if intel's new power profiles will still be a thing with the upcoming 15th gen cpus which profile will you test in the day one review extreme performance or baseline we've talked about this a fair bit so i won't go into it too much um i guess to answer the question though directly, I would test whatever profile appears to be the true default setting because that's what we try to do. We try to test CPUs in their out of the box configuration with minimal interference on our end. So you know we load the memory, whether it's mm-hmm. Expo or XMP, we'll load that, but we generally try not to tune uh, the CPUs too much. Too much, like we yeah, because it's. It's not us to say what is stable. We don't want to tell you guys, oh, undervolt the Ryzen CPUs by this much because it you know, yields much better results. Like, no, because it might not be stable. And likewise, we're not telling you about memory tuning and how to overclock and what to do. They're, that's separate content pieces. And it, it's impossible for us to say whether that will be stable for you or not. Um, and it can lead to problems like we've seen. So not good situation. Uh, I would think that this situation wouldn't arise with 15 gen CPUs. This is this situation has happened because of uh, um, you know unexpected instability issues, and Intel's basically trying to wriggle their way out of what would you say taking responsibility for it almost. Like I've said, a get out of jail free card. They're basically saying, well. Although this in-spec behavior is in-spec, it's not the default spec, so maybe you should try the default spec. And by default spec, we don't mean the recommended spec, we mean the mm-hmm. default spec and possibly not the baseline spec. But and just that's what they've done there. So they, they've, they've created this situation um, which they would be looking to not recreate with 15th gen. 15th gen, they would be want to be very clear about what the spec is. But... Having Especially said if they're that, much more efficient. Like, there's not as much need for all those specs if the parts are much more efficient. Yeah, having said that, it's Intel. Um, they may just continue along with the way they are, and if things go awry, they can just do what they've done with this 14th gen Core i9 K skew parts. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't expect that to be the situation. <laughs> we just have to wait and see. All right, Tim, we're done. The Red Bull's worn off now. Um, you Q cooked. Q and A series is over. Yeah, I need to go have a nap. Yeah, I'm at that age Wait, now where doesn't cook, afternoon naps. Cooked means something different in Australia to other places, doesn't it? I think people have commented that wherever you we are, mean, we mean tired. No, no, wherever you are, I'm cooked. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what you think it is. Uh, but yeah, no, that was good fun. Great, great series. Enjoyed that. Uh, and at, by the time you watch this, we should be pretty close to being on a plane, or possibly being on a plane heading to Taiwan, Taipei to deliver loads more content hopefully on lots of exciting products and yep hopefully the drought is is over now um and the industry will become fun and exciting again and fingers fingers crossed, fingers crossed. i'm crossing everything right yep. now uh but yep that, that's gonna do it uh if you haven't watched part one and part two go find those on the channel watch them because you have a lot of good questions thank you to all of those who did ask questions um always appreciate you guys and of course thanks to everyone who watched uh, we also have Float Plane Patreon if you want to get more Harbour Unbox goodness, exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, behind the scenes content, QA stuff. So, yeah, check that out. But that's going to do it for the May QA series. I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. See you next time.